Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for, once again, the privilege to be able to open up your, your holy word. Lord, I pray that as we look into the scriptures today, that you would give me the wisdom and the fullness of your Holy Spirit, that I might speak clearly and plainly the message that you would have for this hour. May your Holy Spirit also have freedom and liberty to move in each heart and in each life and Lord, I pray that your will would be done today and for all that you do for us, and for all that you do through us, we'll thank you and praise you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake, amen. Romans chapter 16, you'll remember over the past couple of weeks we have, we've seen some wonderful truths as we have come through this, this epistle written to the church in Rome, written by the pen of the Apostle Paul as he was led and directed and inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. And in our study together last time, we mentioned how that we saw him as we've come through this book, we've seen him giving, first of all, there was the explanation that he gave concerning the doctrine of our salvation. Romans chapter 1 through chapter 11, he, he lays out the doctrine of our salvation. He talks about the fact of our sin, how that all of us, whether we're Jew, Gentile, makes absolutely no difference. All men are basically in the same spiritual boat. We have all, we have all sinned. We're, we're all guilty of breaking God's law. We're all guilty of offending God's holiness. And, and, and as a result of that fact, there is a, there is a sense of, the, of, of, of hopelessness that, that reigns in the lives of each and every one of us. Uh, the hopelessness is simply this. Because we're all sinners, none of us can do anything that will impress God. Be, because we're all sinners, none of us, none of us can save ourselves. And then we saw the fact of God's grace. The fact of God's grace, God's gracious provision by which we are cleansed. Our sins are forever washed away. Uh, there's the fact of that we are now redeemed, the provision of redemption. Our, 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 our sins, uh, we've been brought out of the prison house of sin and, and we have been brought into God's kingdom. And, and then there's the wonderful fact that by God's provision, we're justified. Uh, in other words, in the eyes of God now, because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary, it is just as though we never sinned. Justification. And all of that takes place at the very moment when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. All of that happens at the very moment when we put our faith and trust in the finished work of the Savior. That's Romans chapter 1 to chapter 11. But then we came to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, the Apostle Paul then begins dealing with the not the doctrine of our salvation, but the responsibility of our salvation. What, what is expected of us now? as a believer in Jesus Christ. And so in Romans chapter 12 to chapter 14, the Apostle Paul has shown us that as believers in Jesus Christ, there are two basically key things that all of us are to be doing as a Christian. First of all, we are to be loving God supremely and serving Him completely. That, that's number one. We're to be loving God supremely, serving Him serving Him completely. But, but then there's another thing. There's another thing. And that is this. We're to be loving and praying for one another. We're to be loving and praying for one another. And, and then last time in Romans chapter 15, we saw the Apostle Paul requesting that the church in Rome should earnestly be praying for him in, in three matters. First of all, he wanted them to pray for his protection from the Jews there in Jerusalem who, who wanted him dead. And, and so he asked them to pray for his protection. He also asked those churches to pray for his success. For his success. That Jewish believers there in Jerusalem would accept this offering that had been collected from Gentile churches. That would be a sticky point. And, and so he, he wants the churches to pray that, that they will, he will be successful in, in delivering the offering that had been collected. And then also, he wanted them to pray concerning his desire. His desire. And you remember we saw his desire was that he, by the will of God, might have the opportunity to visit those saints there in the city of Jerusalem. 
Now we come to the last chapter. The last chapter. And, and here the Apostle Paul is going to be expressing his affection. He's going to be expressing his appreciation to, to some people that he has worked with. Some people that he has been associated with. So, some people that he has come to know on a personal level through, through the years of, of his ministry. And, and certainly this is not an exhaustive list. It's not an exhaustive list, but, but he's going to mention in these, in these verses that we're going to see, he's, he's going to mention some individuals. He's going to mention some households. And, and most of them he's going to mention by name. He's going to mention by name. Now, many times, sadly, uh, passages like this are overlooked. And, and sadly, passages like this are avoided by, by many, by many pastors and, and, and by many teachers. In other words, they, they come to chapter 15 and when they hit the end of chapter 15, they're done. But the apostle Paul wasn't done there. He, he has some more to say. And so I think it's important for us not to skip this simply because of the fact, as the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16, uh, all doctrine, I'm sorry, I forgot to change the slides. Please forgive me. I'll catch up. There it is. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Did you catch that all? That includes Romans chapter 16, doesn't it? Yeah, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable. In other words, there are things we can learn here. There's some things that we can learn here. You see, even though this chapter is not going to reveal, it's not going to reveal any new, deep, uh, doctrinal truth, you're not going to find that in chapter 16. You'll find that there, but it is beneficial. And it's beneficial because I, I, I like the way one writer noted it. He said, these were real people with real struggles, striving to serve the Lord in the midst of a difficult environment. Can we agree with that? We're, we're kind of there too, aren't we? Yeah, and so these are some th people that we, we can see their life. We can see their testimony. We, we can see their how, how that they live. And it is something that we can learn from them. And we can be encouraged by them. And so let's begin in, in Romans chapter 16, verse number 1. Uh, let's begin by noticing the serving lady. The serving lady. Uh, while it is true, while it is true that ladies are prohibited by God's Word from serving as deacons. They're prohibited by God's Word from serving as pastors in a church. Biblically, there are many other areas where a lady can serve. Now here at HBC, we have some of the finest ladies, and, and honestly, I'm not just saying this to make you feel good, ladies. But we got some of the best ladies in the world right here at HBC. We, we've got some faithful ladies who give of their time, their energy. Uh, many of them aren't even in here right now because they're back there in the junior church. They're, they're in the Sunday school classes. We have some of the greatest ladies in the world. And, and I just want to tell you, ladies, even though you cannot be a pastor and you cannot serve as a deacon, there are so many areas where you can be serving the Lord Jesus Christ in this church. There, there are areas where you can serve. And so in this chapter, as it begins, the Apostle Paul is going to introduce us to a faithful lady. Her name is Phoebe. Her name is Phoebe. And, and notice there are a couple of things we're going to see about her. First of all, there's, there's the commendation. The commendation. Romans chapter 16 and verse number 1. I commend unto you Phoebe. And the Apostle Paul is going to, he's going to begin here because Phoebe is not from Rome. She's not from Rome. She, she's not known in Rome. No, people in Rome did not know her. 
They, they did not know her. So the Apostle Paul is going to commend her. He's going to give her an introduction. And the reason is found in the postscript. If you look down at the end of chapter 16 in, 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 in your Bible, uh, many, many translations, many versions of the Bible will have a postscript there. And, and it's added after the last verse. And the postscript is simply this. This is the lady. After the Apostle Paul wrote this letter, this is the lady who hand delivered it. She carries it to Rome. She's the, she's the male lady, we could say. She's carrying this epistle to the church in Rome. And the Apostle Paul is going to mention three things to the church at Rome as he commends this lady to them. First of all, he talks about her relationship. Verse number six, or chapter 16, verse number one. I commend unto you, Phoebe, our sister. I commend unto you, Phoebe, our sister. Now, the Apostle Paul is not referring to the fact that she is physically related to him. We're going to see some physical relations later, but this is not one of them. He's not saying that she is physically his sister. Rather, he is acknowledging the fact that she's been saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. As a result of her salvation, John chapter 1, verse 12, she has been spiritually born into the family of God. Because she has been spiritually born into the family of God, now she can say, as the Lord Jesus instructed His disciples to say, our Father, right? Which art in heaven. In other words, the Apostle Paul is simply saying, this is a lady and she is a sister in Christ. She's been saved by the grace of God. She has become a child of God. Through that relationship she has with God, now we have a relationship with her. By the way, as believers, all of us here this morning, you understand that, right? Uh, I, I, I'm from America. And, and, and some are from Singapore and, and some are from Indonesia and some are from Malaysia and some are from other places. But I want you to understand that through faith in Christ, we are related because we have the same father. We've been saved by the grace of God. He is our father and therefore we have that relationship. And by the way, you've heard the old saying, blood is thicker than water. You, you've heard that, right? Do you realize that we are actually not only related, we're blood relatives because the same blood that saved my soul, that same blood saved your soul if you've been born again. So we're not just related. I mean, we're really related through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul then refers to her as our sister. Not only did we see her relationship, notice number two, we see her activity. Her activity. In, in, in verse number one, the Apostle Paul continues. I, he says, I commend unto you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church. Now, the, the name Phoebe actually comes from a root. It, it carries the idea of bright and radiant. That's the meaning of her name. Bright and radiant. And, and it's obvious that she lived up to her name by the way she served in her church. And by the way, notice the word servant there. Notice the word servant. Uh, th this has created a lot of discussion. It's created a lot of controversy because the word servant in our text actually comes from the Greek word dekanos. Dekanos. Uh, it's the term that literally means, literally means to kick up the dust. That's what it literally means. Is, is someone who kicks up the dust. In other words, it is a servant who is so busy serving. You, 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 you've seen the cartoons sometimes, you know, someone is, they're, they're, they're walking so fast, there's a little cloud of dust behind them. That, that's the idea here. That's the idea. Shit, kicking up the dust. So busy serving. So busy serving, going here and there, doing the work that, that needs to be done. And, that, and that's why we find that same word, dekanos, it, it's also used to refer to those who, who run errands. You remember in the Gospel of John chapter 2? Jesus goes to Cana of Galilee and you remember He tends the wedding there? And, 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 and you know the story, they, they run out of wine. And so Jesus calls in, he calls in these men. 
He says, I want you to go and I want you to run to the well and I want you to bring in water. Those servants who went to get the water, the Greek term there is dikanos. It's the same term. They were servants who were given an errand. They're busy running on an errand. Uh, that same term is also used for those who would serve tables. You, you remember in Acts chapter 6, when the church was having a, having, they were facing a difficulty. They had widows and, and nobody was really taking care of them. And, and, and so we find that there were a group of men who were chosen. Uh, their job was to, was to wait on tables. And, and they are called, they're called deaconos. In our Bible, it's translated as deacons. They were translated, they're deacons. But, but basically, these were men who were called to a position, not of real authority to lead, but they're called to a position of help. Their job is to serve in such a way, they're to serve in such a way so that the apostles, the preachers, could give themselves continually to prayer and to ministry. They would serve. They would serve. So you see, contrary to the teaching of some, Phoebe was not voted in at the AGM to become a deacon in the church. But let me just mention this. Our last AGM, and I, I don't know who it was, but uh, on the nomination forms that came in, we actually had a couple of ladies who were nominated. Now, folks, we ought to know better than that. We ought, we ought to know better than that. I'm just telling you, uh, ladies can serve in it, but they cannot serve as a pastor or as a deacon, okay? Cannot, cannot do that. Cannot do that. Uh, that would have been a clear violation to the qualifications that are listed. First of all, by example, in Acts chapter 6, you notice those men, the, the ones chosen uh, to be deacons, they were all men. And so the example is there. But not only would it be a violation of the qualification given by example, it's also a violation of the qualification that is given by commandment in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 12. But here's the point. Here's the point. Even though she had no official position, Phoebe was a faithful lady with a glowing testimony who is always busy doing whatever she could to serve her Savior and to be a blessing and a help to her pastor and to her church. Which brings us to a third thing. Her membership. Her membership. In Romans chapter 16 and verse number 1, once again, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Censoria. Which is at Censoria. Now you remember the Apostle Paul wrote this letter while he was in Corinth. And the city of Censoria was on the east side of that isthmus, that natural land bridge that connected the two seaports. Bottom line, Phoebe uh, lived there in Censoria and, and she would have been well known by the Apostle Paul there. Uh, but I want you to notice the expectation. The expectation, letter B. When Phoebe delivered this epistle to the church in Rome, there's some instructions that were given. First of all, they are to accept her. There to accept her. Verse number two, the Apostle Paul says that you receive her. This is instructions for Rome. I, I, I'm sending this lady. She's bringing this letter that I've written. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to receive her in the Lord as becometh saints. In other words, don't view her as a stranger to be ignored. Don't view her as a stranger to be ignored. We have, we have visitors here this morning. You members of HBC, this will be a good day for you to practice. Don't ignore them. Okay? Don't pretend like you don't notice they're here. Uh, make a, yourself a, 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 an official greeter. And, and go and let them know. Let them know that you're glad that they're here. Uh, accept them. Receive them as a person with wide open arms. Welcome them. Accepting them. Now, notice the Apostle Paul adds that. As becometh saints. Do you get that? And our, this is how we ought to act. To everybody that comes our way. We, we, ought to be, we ought to be thankful for those who visit. And we ought to show our appreciation that they're here. There's a lot of other places they could be this morning, but they chose to be here with us. And we ought to let them know we appreciate that. We appreciate that. And, and so Paul says to the, to the church in Rome, uh, this lady, I want, you to, I want you to receive her. 
I want you to accept her. Not only do I want you to accept her, he even goes a step further. He says, I want you to assist her. I want you to assist her. Verse number two, that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of. In other words, the church in Rome is there to look after, there to assist her in, in, in every way that they can as if she were one of their own members. That's, that's how they're to assist. As if she's one of their own members. And, and, and then let her see, notice the, the justification for this. Why would the Apostle Paul say all of that about this lady? She's not even from Rome. She's from Caesarea. Why would the Apostle Paul tell the church in Rome to do all of these things for her? Well, here's the justification for it. Verse number two. For or because she hath been a succorer of many and of myself also. That word succorer simply means she is one who she's helped other people. She's been faithful to encourage other people. She's gone out of her way to show friendship and help and support to other people. And, and, and in fact, the Apostle Paul says not just other people, she's done the very same thing for me as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so I want you, I want you to do these things. I want you to help her, to assist her. I want you to accept her as a brother or as a sister rather in Christ. Certainly, certainly a lot we can learn from this lady. Certainly a lot we can learn from Phoebe, a serving lady worthy of recognition. A serving lady who is worthy of honor. But I want you to notice the second group now. And I say group because this now we're, we're going to find a faithful couple. A faithful couple. Let me give you a little bit of background. In 41 AD, during his first uh, year as reign of the Roman, as a Roman emperor, uh, Claudius placed restrictions on the Jews. He, he said Jews could not meet together. He, they could not meet together. The reason seems to be that there was, a, there was a controversy. The Jews were fighting among themselves. There were the Mosaic Jews who believed they had to keep the law of Moses, but there were also those Messianic Jews who believed that Christ was the end of the law and, and that the Jews were no longer under all of that. And so there's this friction within the Jewish community. And, and because they're fighting with one another, Claudius basically says, okay, all Jews... No more meetings together. No more meetings together. But his ban did not solve the problem. And so therefore in 49 AD, he just kicks all of the Jews out of Rome. He, he just tells them all to get out of Rome because of their continued rioting. Because of their continued rioting. And it was during that time that a Jewish couple by the name of Aquila and, and his wife Priscilla moved from Rome, went down to the city of Corinth where they established a tent-making business. The next year in 50 AD, the Apostle Paul, Acts chapter 18, during his second missionary journey, he actually goes to the city of Corinth. And while he's there, he meets Aquila and Priscilla. And for one and a half years, they provided lodging for him. And not only provided lodging for him, they provided employment for him. They, they actually put him to work. You see, in Jewish tradition, part of a boy's education is to learn a trade. That, that was Jewish tradition. Part of a boy's education was to learn a trade. In fact, I, I've read that a common Jewish saying back in Bible times was this, he who does not teach his son a trade teaches him to become a thief. Pretty good saying, actually, if you stop and think about it. You don't teach your son a trade. You're actually teaching him to become a thief. And so therefore, even as a boy, the Apostle Paul had been trained as a tent maker. He'd been trained as a tent maker. And so when the Apostle Paul left Corinth and, and, and went to Ephesus, uh, Priscilla and Aquila went with him. And they settled there in the city of Ephesus for a time. Acts chapter 18, verse 18 to 19. But when Emperor Claudius died in 54 AD, the Jews are then allowed to return to the city of Rome. And so therefore the Apostle Paul now, in his letter to the church at Rome, here's what he says. He says, I want you to do this. I want you to greet Priscilla and Aquila. I, I, I want you, we, we have a history. We have a history. And I want you to greet them. 
because they are my helpers in Christ Jesus. I want you to greet them. Now the Apostle Paul briefly mentions how this faithful couple helped him. What did they do that was so helpful for the Apostle Paul? Well, first of all, they helped him by their bravery. They helped him by their bravery. Verse number four. Who have for my life laid down their own necks? You you heard the saying about putting your neck on the line for somebody else? Yeah, that's what these folks did. And they did it literally. They, they, They put their neck on the line. They put their luck on the, on the line. They, in other words, they, they endangered themselves in order to help the Apostle Paul and to rescue and to save the life of the Apostle Paul. Now, now we do not know. We do not know where this took place. We do not know when it took place. It, it may have been in the city of Corinth in, in, for, in, in Acts chapter 18, verse 12, when, when the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to a judgment seat. That may have been the time when Aquila and Priscilla stood up and they, they put their neck on the line to save him. Or, or it may have been in the city of Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, verse 30, when the craftsmen who made their, by, made their living by producing those idols that were dedicated to to the worship of the goddess Diana. And you remember they wanted to put the Apostle Paul on a public trial. They, they want to do away with him because by his preaching, people are getting saved. And when they get saved, they don't buy idols anymore. And it's hitting them in their pocketbook. And, and so they want to get rid of the Apostle Paul. And they want to bring him on trial. And it may have been at that time, Quill and Priscilla put their life on the line, put their neck on the line in order to rescue him. In order to rescue him. Or it may have been in both places. <laughs> they had done it once here and did it once there. We do not know. But whenever it was and wherever it was, here's what the Apostle Paul says in verse number four Unto whom not only I give thanks, I notice this, not only am I thankful for this, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. You see, not only was he personally thankful that by their heroic actions, his life had been spared. All of those Gentile churches that were established and built up through his ministry that was able to continue because Aquila and Priscilla had rescued him by putting their necks on the line. All of those Gentile churches are also thankful. They're also thankful for what they have done Because the Apostle Paul has been able to continue to give them spiritual direction and spiritual instruction by their bravery. Not only is the Apostle Paul thankful for them but because of their bravery, but also because of their hospitality. You remember when the Apostle Paul arrived in the city of Philippi? You remember when he arrived in the city of Philippi? He he, he met that wealthy businesswoman. You remember Lydia? Uh, she, she was a wealthy businesswoman, a lady who was dealing in, in the selling of, of purple and all of that. Uh, probably she drove a BMW and wore a Rolex. I just said that because I want to see if you all are listening, okay? Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, she, she was a wealthy businesswoman and, and, and was doing well. And you remember how that she, she was brought to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and you remember as a result of that in Acts chapter 16, verse 15, she invited the Apostle Paul and, and his missionary team to stay in her house. But not only did he invite, did she invite them to stay in her house, she also invited him, Acts chapter 16, verse 40, to start a church in her house. To start a church in her house. That's why after being released from that Philippian jail, after the earthquake, the Apostle Paul went to Lydia's house. And there he met with the brethren. That's where the church would meet. They they all met in the house uh, of this lady by the name of Lydia. And And I think the same thing was true. The same thing was true of Priscilla and Aquila. After they came to know the Apostle Paul there in the city of Corinth, whether they were saved under his ministry or when they were saved when they arrived in Corinth already. We don't know. We don't know. But what we do know is that when, he, when they met together, they, they, opened, they opened their home to him. 
And it became the birthplace for the church at Corinth. For those of you who've been here for a long time, and you know the history of Heritage Baptist Church, do you remember 25 Dunsfold Drive? Yeah, that, that was the home of Pastor and Mrs. Worley. And it was in their living room that this church was born. It was in their home, in their living room. And, and the same thing was true of Priscilla and Aquila. It was in their home where the church at Corinth was born. And, and then while they were in Ephesus, while they were in Ephesus, the Apostle Paul writing a letter back to the church at Corinth. Interesting thing. He's writing a letter back to the church at Corinth. And in that letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19, he sends greetings to the Corinthians from the church in Ephesus, which is meeting in the home of Priscilla and Aquila. Later on, after returning to Rome from Ephesus, Priscilla and Aquila once again opened their home to a church. Once again, they, they show their hospitality to the work of God. They open their home to the church that is there. And, and, and so therefore, the Apostle Paul in chapter 16, verse 5, he says this. He says, likewise, likewise, just as you greet Priscilla and Aquila in Christian love, just as you greet them in the very same way, greet the church. Every member. Greet the church that is in their house. That is in their house. There are many more friends, many more associates that the Apostle Paul is going to introduce to us as we consider this final chapter together. But these three, Phoebe, Priscilla, Aquila, the, these three have certainly given us an example to follow because they were known. They were recognized. They were honored. First of all, for their faithfulness. First of all, for their faithfulness. Secondly, they're honored and they're recognized because of their bravery. In other words, these were people who are so committed to God's work and so committed to God's servants that they are willing to do whatever it might cost them, even their own lives. That's the level of commitment that they have. And so we see they're, they're honored, they're recognized for their faithfulness, for their bravery, and then also for their hospitality. For their hospitality. I want to close with a question. Close with a question. How do those who know us, how do they view our walk with God? How do they, how do they view our service to God? How do they view our commitment to God and to His work? Something to think about. Something to think about. May each one of us this morning be challenged by the testimonies of these three saints to become the faithful, committed servants of the Lord Jesus and His church that we ought to be. And for those this morning who perhaps you have never yet trusted in Christ as your Savior, let me just say to you that all of the good you may want to do. See, some people have the idea, well, you know, I'm going I'm to go to church. I'm going to continue to enjoy my sin, but I'll go to church and I'll put a lot of money in the offering. Okay? Now that may impress me, but God's not impressed. Okay? God's not going to be impressed. You, 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 you cannot earn or merit God's faith. There's only one way we can come to God, and that's through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of our sin and trusting in what Jesus Christ did for us for the salvation of our soul. That's the only way. That's the only way. Serving in the church will do you no good if you don't know the Savior. But for those of us who know the Savior, what does our service say about our relationship with God? Something to think about to prayerfully consider. Heavenly Father, we thank You this morning for, for Your Word. We thank You for these three wonderful examples of a godly Christian that have, been, that have been shown to us by the Apostle Paul, ladies, and a man who, who, who went above and beyond 
in order to be a service to you and a service to your church and to your ministers. Lord, I pray that you would help the members of HBC that as we consider these things together, may your Holy Spirit convict us and cause us to have the desire to be that kind of a believer, that kind of a Christian. And Lord, for those here this morning who perhaps they've not yet trusted in Christ as their Savior, I pray today would be a day of salvation for them. As we have this time of invitation, may your will be done in each heart and in each life. We ask it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen.